economics teaches humility because it teaches us more about what we can't do than what we can do. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and we're talking with Pete Betke at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, Nevada. Pete, thanks for talking to us. Sure thing, Nick. It's great. Your latest book, you're an economist at George Mason University. Your latest book, Living Economics, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. You talk about the passion for economics, two words that don't normally come together. What is passion for economics, and why is it so important? Well, I think economics is a set of eyeglasses, and when you put those eyeglasses on, you bring the world into sharp relief. So it's not so much the ideological position of it, it's understanding it's a way of thinking about the world. It's a, it's a methodology, not an ideology. Right, it's, and, and, but that methodology has implications that are political in nature when you follow persistently and consistently all the way through on that. What is, what is the most, you know, what's the best elevator pitch case for studying economics today? Not necessarily as an academic, but, you know, as, as a human being. Well, I think that the economic way of thinking applies to every walk of life. And so it can make sense about a lot of different issues from the way that we get married, the way we have kids, the way policies are determined by government, the way legal decisions are made, uh, the way we behave in our religious behavior. So economics is not just about the transferring of money. It's about the way that individuals act, the incentives that they face, how they process those incentives. This is kind of a golden age for economic thinking. I mean, you know, whether it's free economics or everywhere, everybody is talking in an economic way, in a way that in other years they might have talked psychologically or right. sociologically. Um, you know, why, why is economics at the forefront right now? Well, I think there's two periods in our lifetime where economics has really moved to the forefront. One of them is when we were kids in the late 1970s with the stagflation and then the beginning of the Reagan, uh, you know, sort of era and, and economics was just on the tongue of everyone. And then there was some, you know, outliers, let's say the groups that we like, Austrian economics, public choice and whatnot, that could explain it. And so then that was kind of a heyday for that kind of thought. And I would say that that's also true since the financial crisis, that what you've had again is everyone is affected by it. You know, they hear it every day in their news. And what economics thinking does is allow them to frame that sort of discussion and then steer it in directions. Of course, in the current discussion, different than the time when we were kids, there's really a battle for the interpretation of what went on. The Bush administration in no way was a free market no or laissez-faire. I mean, yeah, they created I mean, regulations, the whole types of accounting regimes. You name it, they pumped the economy full of funny money. You know, what is the Austrian understanding? Because, I mean, this is, you, when you talk about the Austrian school, this is something when I studied undergraduate economics, you know, Hayek and Mises got one paragraph in a 600 page textbook. Not that way anymore. What's going on that Austrian, the Austrian school of economics well, is moving to higher When you power. have a financial crisis like this, the Austrian theory of the business cycle becomes something that people try to think through to make sense of what's going on. Obviously, there's a lot of contending perspectives. So I would say that Austrian economics mixed with public choice economics, mixed with institutional or property rights economics forms the basis of this, but that people like Mises and Hayek were the, the sort of first movers in developing that kind of program in the modern times. Talk about you know, what, what defines the Austrian school in your mind as well as public choice. The idea choice. That, that the unit of analysis is the individual human actor the human actor acting within constraints, which in some sense can be the lack of time, material resource, but also just the rules that they you know, engage in and that those rule environments are gonna dictate the flow of incentives and information that people work with in making their decisions. What's the Austrian reading then, or your Austrian reading of the financial crisis? Because we hear from uh, you know, stimulatarians, whether they're Keynesian or monetarists, saying what we need to do is have the government flood the economy with more money to restart the economy, and it can be through the Fed if you're a monetarist, or it can be through uh, the- Stimulus yeah, package, yeah. yeah if you're so Keynesian. I think that what you see there is Keynesianism, but you have a waffling between conservative Keynesianism or liberal Keynesianism. But let's go back to the Austrians for a second there. I think that the one of the big things with the Austrians is to recognize that the recession is the correction, all right? And the, the previous uh, malinvestments that were generated by the you know stimulus of the money, right? Sort of pushing down easy credit, manipulation of money and credit led to malinvestments. So what you have is, okay, why did those malinvestments take place in a particular industry? So you have to have the malinvestment 
or excuse me, the, the manipulation of money and credit, then combined with various different rules and regulations, which meant that housing was an attractive place to make those investments in. And so you have to look at a, like a perfect storm kind of thing, right? So you have Greenspan doing the Greenspan put. You have, you know, various different things from the community, uh, you know, reinvestment, you know, all these kind of things, pushing money in a direction there. You have Fannie and Freddie, you know, going their direction, all of that going in one direction, which means that you get the housing bubble. And then, of course, the bust on the housing bubble. You'll relate to this is like when I first went to buy a house, it was in the old days when you had to have 20 percent down. The prudent rule was that you wouldn't spend any more on a mortgage than what you would have in one week's of your gross pay. Right? right? That was being prudent. And, and you go forward 20 years later, and one of my graduate students, you know, rolled three mortgages in to buy a house, basically almost zero money down. And it was, you know, and what happened to banking during that time? Well, a whole boatload of policies were passed that made it difficult for bankers to scrutinize the investment loans. Barney Frank is really responsible for a lot of that. And so one of the things that was funny about 2008, funny in a bad sense, is that Barney Frank who used to accuse banks of engaging in discriminatory lending, now we're accusing them of predatory lending for lending to the very folks that he said they needed to lend to, otherwise they were discriminatory lending. And he didn't get like lambasted for that. And so the, I mean, you know, the difference is a kind of Keynesian or macro approach is the government, you know, the government, or, or rather from an Austrian perspective, the government rigged markets, the markets collapse, and then Keynesians say, well, we need more government intervention. Yeah. The Austrians say no. You you know when you you pump up a balloon, it's going to pop, and you got to start. Look at over. right now what's going on. You know Bernanke spending 85 billion a month in the to keep long-term interest rates low. What's that done to mortgage rates? Pushed them way down. So in Northern Virginia, where we live, one of the things that we've seen is an increase in the housing market. You know going up. But what's interesting is that. While the money is available, the banks are being more scrutinizing the loans more. So one of the things that we've seen, you know, go look this up, is that you have a lot of contracts falling through at the assessment stage, which never used to happen, right? The assessment was always, uh, you know, fade, you know, kind of complete. What's you know? the, uh, what are the limits of those eyeglasses, those economic eyeglasses when you put them on? Mark used to rail against homo, homo economicus. I mean, do is is a, an economic worldview is it is it sufficient to explain everything, or what are the limits to it? And are we getting hubristic in thinking economics explains everything? Well, I think that the key issue isn't hubris. It's that what happens is that economics teaches humility because it teaches us more about what we can't do than what we can do. The the limit that I would recognize is that. It's the easiest way to put this is that economists cannot tell you whether or not profits are deserved or not, but what it, the economics can do is tell you the answer, the consequences of your answer to that question. So there is a limit of economics. I can't tell you those normative ideas, but what I can tell you is the consequences of your normative you know, position. So I think that there, there is a point where economics interacts with normative issues. And again, we also have to recognize is that a lot of things that I said about rules Rules are the framework within which economic activity takes place. Well, then what justifies that framework? For most economists, we sort of treat that framework as given and then analyze the consequences. But that framework, for example, can be determined by natural law for example, or some other version. I happen to be a rule utilitarian, so I like sort of make those kind of arguments. The connection between my economics and my morality is much tighter than a lot of other people. But you can think a lot of great classical liberals. Adam Smith, he's a natural law person, and then, you, you know, and, and that's where economics, economics isn't natural law. Economics comes in after the natural law sets the framework. I want to thank Pete Betke at George Mason University and the author most recently of Living Economics, uh, author of the forthcoming book tentatively titled Don't Panic, Always Good Advice. Pete Betke, thanks for talking to Reason TV. Thanks a lot, Nick. I appreciate it.